For me, making visual music involves both a foray into advanced digital technology and a test of my skills as a clarinetist. In this presentation, I'm aiming to explain how visual mental imagery, that is, art in mind, plays a pivotal role in both the way music is created and the way in which it is listened to. In the process, I think you'll see that there's much more to visual music than first meets the eye or engages the ear. I'll start in the city of Fatipa Sikri in North India. It's a ghost town now, but for a brief period in the 16th century, it was the city where Emperor Akbar, Akbar the Great, gathered together musicians from every corner of North India to give regular performances of Hindustani classical music at his court. So as to better understand the complexities of Indian raga, he underwent some training as a vocalist enough to develop an in-depth appreciation of the skills of the 30 or so classical musicians he retained at his court. Soon after Akbar's move to the new city of Fatipa Sikri in 1570, he was joined there by Mian Tansen, who quickly became the emperor's favourite musician, even though, at 57, he was well beyond the normal retiring age. One anecdote in particular illustrates the central role of music at Fatipa Sikri. Akbar asked Tansen to sing Raga Deepak, the Raga of Light, with the result that all the lamps in the palace courtyard lit up spontaneously, and Tansen's body became dangerously hot. But as Tansen had known in advance what would happen, he had taken the precaution of teaching his daughter to play one of his own compositions, Raga Mian Maha, which by repute caused rain to pour down. And when she played, the heavens opened and Tansen was saved. We shouldn't take such a story literally, because as Ravi Shankar explains, ragas induce an enhanced state in the minds of listeners rather than changes in the physical environment that surrounds them. Raga is a prime example of art in mind. The unbroken tradition of Hindustani classical music stretches back 2,000 years or more to when ragas were an integral part of Vedic ceremonies in Hindu temples. Then, as now, the universal, deeper meaning of raga performance was conveyed by the Sanskrit saying, Ranjehati iti raga which means that which colours the mind is a raga. To an extent, I followed Akbar's example by immersing myself in Rajayati Iti Raga so as to gain some understanding of the art of raga performance, which differs radically from what we are used to as performers in the West. The result, raga time, is both an oral and visual interpretation of Biliskani Todi, a raga reputedly performed by Tansen's son, Bilas Kani, at his father's funeral to evoke a mood of delightful admiration. It follows the oldest of the Hindustani classical genre, known as Drupad, a genre that Tansen developed into the form as it's largely known today. It starts with an alap, which is a deep and meditative musical investigation into the rising and falling seven-note octave, which characterises Belaskani Todi. When performed, the alap presents a powerful force of emotions such as sadness, yearning, and submission to a heightened state of awareness, where, as tradition dictates, the singer or instrumentalist sets the rasa, that's the emotion or sentiment of the piece, and at the same time assesses the mood of the audience. In Raga time, I supplement this oral mode of expression with a visual mode, which reveals momentous events taking place in Akbar's court. I haven't needed to imagine these scenes in my mind's eye, because Akbar kept an atelier of artists at Fatipa Sikri, who recorded every moment of court life in a series of Indian miniatures that are now distributed in galleries throughout the world. And from this immense store or memory bank of information, I've chosen just a few images that, to my mind, reflect the music of Biliskani Todi and tell the story.
I now perform the first part of Ragatan. <laughs> recognize that those images in Raga time served only to provide a cultural prompt in guiding your responses to Biliskani Todi. They didn't add significantly to the emotional impact of the music. But now I'll move on to my second example of visual music, where I set my sights higher by making a determined effort to penetrate the mind of a composer so as to uncover the hidden imagery that lay behind his notation. The piece is called A Beam Des Oiseaux, Abyss of the Birds. It throws some new light on this synesthetic world of Olivier Messiaen, a composer who during his lifetime revealed much about his sound world, but remained comparatively reticent about his world of colour. It was during a conversation with Claude Samuel in 1986 that Messiaen gave some first insight into the colours that moved with his music when he explained how the shimmering stained glass of Chartres Cathedral had provided throughout his life a joyful experience, a place where he could fully indulge the sensory impact of his synesthetic world. For me, this was the key that enabled me to locate the imagery that lay behind the composer's notation for A Beam Day's Oiseau, a piece for solo clarinet that became eventually a central movement within Messiaen's quartet for the end of time. All of my imagery for a beam des oiseaux was based on a single rose window at Chartres Cathedral. By incorporating in my interpretation celestial colours, abstract shapes and religious references, all gleaned from my rose window source, I was aiming to second guess the visual mental images that could have occupied Messiaen's own mind when composing the piece. I'll perform part of it now. After a very slow and sad start, it becomes lively and capricious.
only after completing my visual interpretation that I came across Messiaen's preface to Color de la Cité Celeste, a piece written in 1964, over 20 years after the Quartet for the End of Time. At this later date, Messiaen overtly declared that its form was dependent on colour, like the rose window of a cathedral with its flamboyant and invisible colours. A description which, as it happened, aptly described my visual interpretation of a beam day's weather. This explicit reference to the rose window's flamboyant and invisible colours appeared to endorse my own choice of imagery. But how had this happened? Why had I chosen just this one specific rose window as my source of visual inspiration when in fact I had any number of other sources to choose from? I can see now that it was Messiaen's synesthetic skills that made my choice inevitable. It was his ability to accurately transmute a wide range of celestial colours into audible sound combinations that enabled me to hear the colours that moved with his music, and thereby see what was in his mind's eye. It wasn't so much that I'd found the right images for a beam day's wazoo, but more that Messio had communicated them to me. Does this explanation sound too fanciful, I wonder? Not, I think, when we begin to uncover some of the mystery that surrounds the way our brains conjure up visual imagery as an endless source of fantasy. When we're listening to music, for instance, many of us allow our minds to wander as we experience visual imagery relating to past events or picturing ourselves in the future. It can be argued that such experience have some therapeutic value by making us feel either more energetic or calmer. Stephen Coslin, in his book, Ghosts in the Mind's Machine, describes mental images as private creations. Although mental imagery and perception, that is, that which we see with our eyes, operate in similar ways, they are far from being identical. With mental imagery, we can think about and transform what our mind's eye has told us. This is the key feature of mental events, the ease by which they can create scenes that never really existed, or, as Coslin comments, transform the commonplace into the extraordinary. Another striking fact about mental images is that we don't have them all the time. It can be assumed, then, that images must be stored in our long-term memories in some way that allows us to call on them when we want them. In this regard, mental imagery is quite different from vision, which operates whenever our eyes are open and brings us a continuous stream of images whether or not we choose to concentrate on them. This voluntary quality of mental images and our capacity to get rid of them when we don't want to look at them explains those fleeting periods of mind wandering that most of us experience when attending a concert. We can decide to indulge in them or switch them off. Such unstable images formed in the mind's eye, literally art in mind, can be described as quasi-pictorial ghosts. They can't easily be compared to the form pictures take in the real world photographs, paintings, or slides. There must be something more diffuse than paper, canvas, or projected beams of light that enables visual mental imagery to take shape. Coslin has put forward the idea of a visual buffer in the brain, which reveals at its centre an image that is fully resolved, that is, in focus, but with decreasing resolution towards the periphery. This means, for instance, that my pictorial representations of Akbar's court are far too evenly resolved. It's appropriate that I've shown them as circles rather than rectangles, but to accord with Coslin's theory, each image should fade away at the edges to the extent that the defined geometry of the circle becomes blurred. As a neuroscientist, as well as a psychologist, Coslin was not only concerned in shape and diffusion, but also in what he perceived as three types of process that operate on images in the visual buffer. The generation process acts on information about the appearance of objects and their spatial structure to create an image in the buffer. 
we become conscious of this pattern of activity taking place. And through a process of inspection, we can then recognize the shape, spatial configurations, and other characteristics of imagined objects. And finally, through transformation processes that rotate, scale in size, and translate the pattern of cells in the buffer, we're able to examine visual mental images from all points of view. These deeper ramifications of visual mental imagery have been the cause of an imagery debate that has occupied the minds of philosophers for hundreds of years. David Hume, for example, underlined the great resemblance between percepts and mental images in every other particular except their degree of force and vivacity. Others, including Jean-Paul Sartre, argued that mental images have a radically different phenomenological status from percepts. It's a debate that will continue to rage as long as the activities of the human brain remain mysterious and inaccessible to finite scientific thought. For me, it raises the question, can I or should I try to manipulate or control listeners' visual mental responses when I create a piece of visual music? Responses that might differ radically from my own very personal take on the music. I always answer yes to this question with the proviso. As long as the visual music I produce adds to listeners' experience of music by informing on its context and arousing emotions that might otherwise lie dormant. So, have I convinced you that there's more to visual music than first meets the eye or engages the ear? I hope so. For me, the process of producing visual music reveals unexpected discoveries and unforeseen outcomes, as occurred, for instance, in A Beam Day's Wazoo, where I heard the covers that moved with Messiaen's music. I find that the delights of making visual music are endless, but overall, my aim in colouring the minds of listeners and viewers is to generate, in audiences, a heightened state of awareness and enjoyment in music.